Greetings, welcome back to Randomtronic. Today let's make some decent cables for USB power delivery. Here is the cable I made a while ago just as a test and I have been using it for a while and it works quite well although there was a few problems in the process of making it. First of all this is the sleeving that I chose, the blue stuff and here is more of it. This came from the local hardware store and it's just a three millimeter blue sleeving. I've got another pack of this. For the thickness of the conductors I'm going to use including the insulation on each conductor it becomes really difficult to squeeze them inside this little tube. Also out of the four conductors inside the USB cable two of them are responsible for delivering power and two are responsible for delivering data and very often the data cables are a twisted pair so they are twisted inside just to reduce the interference from outside affecting the data flow through the cable. With this one however initially I have twisted the wires but as you twist the wires the overall diameter slightly increases it's slightly more than the two individual strands and I was unable to fit this inside of this so the data lines in this cable are not twisted however I have tested it and it seemed to be doing quite okay with data transfers and there isn't an issue but this might vary from location to location and, and it also may depend on what sort of equipment you've got running around in the proximity of your cable so perhaps not the best solution here are some more USB cables and those are the braided type so the more fancy ones I think those I have been using for a while until they stopped working and I think it's the micro USB plug that went on those today we will make a cable that is somewhat similar in construction to one of those so it will be the braided style and to get the braiding we're going to use this so this is just a polypropylene braided rope also known as a paracord, this variety is a 5mm in diameter. A rope like this, if you didn't know, if I'll just cut off a small section, is constructed out of two parts. So there is the internal bit, straight strands that go straight through, there are just long strands of polypropylene, and the outer braiding, which provides some sort of resistance for wear and tear, I guess. Inside threads can be pulled out altogether like so and this can be disposed of and what you're left with is basically a braided tube that's all you have to do is push the wires inside of it another nice property of this is as you squeeze it it becomes a little bit thicker so it makes it easier and as you pull it apart as you stretch it it tightens up on the conductor that will put inside in its final form it will be a nice compact cable so I've cut off approximately two meters of this and as you can see the inside thread comes out quite easily so it's a very easy process to obtain just the sleeve out of the rope as far as the wire for the current line so for the power delivery ground and plus 5 volts I will be using this this is commonly known as equipment wire from the data sheet that I found this appears to be half a millimeter squared here is the part number for RS components 356-476 those I will be using for ground and red one for 5 volts and for the data lines I'll be using this this is significantly thinner compared to the other one here is it for comparison so I'm just going to rip this apart and take two strands whatever color it happens to be as I've separated it out from the rest of the bunch I've chose yellow and blue for the colors over here it comes out with a slight twist but I am going to help this wire to twist a little bit better with a help of a drill that's about enough you don't want it crazy twisted but this is a good amount of twist in a wire last time I did that I've discovered that the wire as it enters the tubing in more in this case the braid gets tangled quite easily so I've made this little helper it's just a piece of blind and I've drilled four holes in it because I had four wires before today we will use only three because we've twisted one wire into a pair feeding it like this to make sure that the cable goes in in the same orientation throughout the entire cable to put the wire inside the braid I'm going to use a little bit of electrical tape just to hold the wires together as one bunch and attach it to one piece of skewer stick the front of it which was very sharp I've purposely cut off and made it nice and round so it doesn't catch on onto strands inside the braid 
cable prepared like this should be quite easily to fit inside the braid. One more thing, the braiding will quickly fall apart, basically untangle itself if we don't do anything to the end of it. So what I'm going to do is cut off a small bit just to make sure that I've got a nice clean edge. Let's melt the end of it a little bit just to prevent it from unwinding or untangling itself. So I'm just going to use the hot air gun. From what I tried before this is plenty hot to give it a, a little bit of a melt and we can start threading the wire in like so with a little bit of wiggling it comes on quite easily and here it is out the other end let's cut those wires off so they're all equal and let's strip a small maybe about a centimeter of length of each wire it's a little bit more than we need but I'll show you why in a moment twist the wires nicely together you can tell over here how much difference in the copper content it is in the both wires. I mean, this one is significantly bigger. As I twisted it, it comes up to 0.7 millimeter, and the thinner ones, that's the data ones, 0.3. I'm going to also need a small piece of a heat shrink tubing. I've got one piece over here that I'm going to cut in half. This is for the thinner wires, the data ones. Last time I did it, I've noticed when I try to solder it, the insulation on the cable just runs away from the heat, just melts away completely. And that's not good. But I think we can avoid that by putting a little bit of heat shrink on top of the original insulation and this way the wire will stay insulated for the precise length. And with wires prepared like this I'm going to apply some flux onto all the wires. Let's see if the insulation runs away from the heat. No, nope. this works quite well. I haven't tried it before but this seems to do the trick. And let's cut all of those to length. It's much easier to thin a longer piece of wire and then cut them. This way you get a much nicer finish like this. We won't need much for the micro USB connector which I'm going to be soldering on first. And here is the micro USB plug. And as you can see there are five pins inside. If you don't see, trust me, there are five. And as you can see there are five connectors, three on the top and two on the back. When trying to determine what to solder to what, just be careful because I have seen plugs that are manufactured this way, so with the rounded bit to the top, but there are only two pins on top and three on the bottom opposite to what's on this one. The safe bet is to look at the pin in this orientation and then you know that the pins go from one to five from left to right. So this will be one, then two is on the back, three, four and five at the very end. And what those pins are, one is the plus 5 volts, then there is data minus data plus, so D minus D plus. In case of our micro USB, the fourth one is the ID pin for USB on the go. We can ignore that and leave that unconnected. And the fifth one here is the ground. So in case of this connector, we're going to need all the three pins on this side, tin the pads to make sure the soldering goes nice and easy. What I'm aiming for is something exactly like here where there is a nice little blob of solder on each pad. I almost forgot to put a little bit of heat shrink over the entire cable. And now in theory, with the tinned wire and the tinned pad, all we have to do is place them together, heat them up a little bit and they should soon too become one. And here it is soldered up, a little bit butchered over here. I've looked too long on the camera rather than at what I'm doing but that's okay that will still work just fine and after pushing the braided sleeve all the way up to the connector we can put on the heat shrink like so and shrink it up and this entire assembly should fit nicely inside the case the black part as you can see has got little locator pins on each side and those should fit inside the groove over here. I'm not entirely sure which one because you could put it I guess in either of them. There are two sets and with one of them it sticks out a little bit further. I'll put it in the front one. Maybe that will be useful with some hard to access connectors. Now the other side of the casing. There we go that's one end of the cable finished. And for the other end, here is the plug I've got. One I've decided to use with this kind of connector thing. The pinout on this one where you have the plastic former on the bottom, the numbers of the connectors go 1, 2, 3 and 4 from right to left. Just like in the micro USB one, that will be 5 volts, D minus, D plus 
and ground. There is no fifth pin in here because USB host detection is done slightly differently on this. This is always a host. So again, a little bit of light flux and let's put some solder onto the pads. So now we want to stretch out the sleeving, the braiding, as much as we can to make sure it grips nicely onto the cable. But yeah, it seems like it's going to exceed the length of the cable. I'm going to cut a small section off. And when it's the right length, I can melt it a little bit to prevent the cable becoming a mess. When this is all nicely stretched, the cable has got a little bit of stiffness to it. That's what you call an anti-tangling cable. So now we need to gauge how much wire we actually need out of the sleeving all the way to here. So let's put a heat shrink on, choose a red one this time, because why not? And let's put a small amount of insulation from all the cables, the same as before, twist the wires. We will put some heat shrink on the data cables to prevent it from melting away from soldering. Like this. And again, same as before, let's thin the wires trim the ends a little bit and now the socket so remembering that this is one two three four plus d minus d plus and ground so after pulling back the braiding all the way to the plug and now heat shrinking the piece of heat shrink that we've put on we ended up with a nice cable. That all that's left to do is put it inside the casing, inside the housing for the plug. However, there is a slight problem. So the thickness of the cable is far bigger than the hole inside the plug because this has been designed for a flimsy, thin little rubbish cable, not like the proper cable that we're making today. Oh yeah, that's much better. But yeah, a dab of super glue won't hurt. Maybe I'll do that off camera later on. For now I've decided to just put a one wrap of electrical tape around the plug to keep it in place. I'll figure out later on whether I want to super glue this or not. But here is the complete cable. And remember this is a 2 meter cable. Relatively long as far as USB goes. Let's give it a test. First let's make sure that we've wired everything up correctly. So for that purpose I'm going to use something inexpensive like this power bank. And let's plug it in and see what happens. And we are drawing power so safe assumption would be it's not backwards or anything it's it works and there is a little LED inside and it's drawing one amp happily a little bit over one amp let's give it some load so I've got the DC load over here when we will plug it into micro USB port at the top so what I'm looking for remember that this is a 2 meter cable so at one amp we've got 4.9 volts so 0.3 of a volt drop, let's up it up to 2 amps, 4.7, 3 amps, 4.46 volt. It will happily do 2 amp charging and there wouldn't be any issues whatsoever. And the USB specification says that the voltage on the USB cable for USB 2.0 should be 5 volts and there is a margin of error allowable plus 0.25 of a volt or minus 0.6 of a volt. In theory, USB voltage should be anywhere between 4.4 to 5.25 volts. Let's see how much current we can draw so we can drop to 4.4 volts. 3.2 and a half volts 3.4 amps 4.44 now the fan kicked in so it took my readings a little bit out but let's go back down yeah let's call that three and a half amps and we're still within the usb spec of a two meter long cable that's not too bad i think let's do one more test using the um34c because this has got a function of measuring the resistance of a USB cable. Drawing one amp for the purpose of this test and what we're going to do is press and hold this button that will take the direct measurement from the USB port directly from the voltage source. So we press and hold that. Now it's gone to a second one where we can plug in a cable. So let's do that. And again the same current and let's press and hold the button. And there we go. Our cable resistance is 0.291 ohms according to the calculation so it dropped 0.2 of a volt and that's quite reasonable for a cable of this length 
For a comparison, let's do a test with another cable. This is a one meter long cable. It came with some kind of device. I don't know what it came with, probably some mobile phone a while back. Yeah, let's do exactly the same test. So one amp load, plug in the cable and let's take a measurement. There we go. So this cable at half the length is 0.531 of an ohm, so almost double of the resistance of the cable that's twice as long at the resistance per meter. This is four times better than this factory cable that came with a mobile phone of unknown origins. That's why you should make your own USB cables if you can, because it's worth it. They do work a lot better and you can put a lot more current through. You can make them any length that you want. Well, within reason, I think USB allows up to 5 meters. That's before you have to get into active repeaters. Hope you enjoyed the video and I hope it answered all your questions about how I made those cables and what sort of conductors I used and how to wire them up and whatever else that you might wanted to ask. So that's how you can make your own USB cables to charge various equipment that you've got lying around. Now I haven't got a USB type C connectors yet. Decent ones are a little bit more difficult to get a hold of at the moment. For the time being I think I'm just going to order a few micro to type C adapters so I can use the cables I made for the type C equipment as well. But for today that's it. I hope you enjoyed it and found it informative. Please remember to hit the subscribe button if you haven't done so already and leave me a comment below the video to tell me what you think of the cables we've made today. For today that's it. Take care.